morning, everyone. My name is Hanna Maurer Sibley. I'm with Ericsson. I'm heading up a unit called Head of Radio Network Solution. Thank you very, very much for 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 ha- being here. So I will I will start by a, a small contest. So um, as you know, since Ericsson is one of our main um, um, partners, uh, we have we we have done a major uh, upgrade and modernization of our access network. And uh, since 2022, um, NOJ has, has been receiving several recognitions in terms of uh, uh, its mobile network and uh, uh, the quality and the experience, etc. And recently, um, NOJ has been awarded with the fastest mobile network in Europe, uh, Bayukla, which for us is really uh, uh, very important recognitions uh, because it, uh, it, uh, it means that really uh, Nós and Portugal are in the high-performance net mobile networks in Europe. What is the importance of these uh, high-performance mobile networks for Nós and, and for Portuguese uh, uh, users overall? How do you see uh, the contributions to the economy and also for the technology evolution? How do you see it? Well, it's a very good question. And uh, first, I guess I have to say congratulations, right? So well done. Uh, this is not an easy reward to get from Ukla, and I know that uh, many operators are having this as their internal targets right, uh, throughout the years to come. So you asked how these very high-performing networks can help uh, the country and its citizens within, right? And uh, we do quite a lot of studies on this. And um, one study that we've done shows that approximately 2.7 billion euros would be benefited on the GDP in Portugal if, you know, you would actually be able to unlock a full potential of a 5G advanced and a 5G SA network. So getting there with a high performing and winning the UCLA benchmark is a great step on the way. And why we do these kinds of analysis is, of course, that we would like to see how can the networks benefit society and industry and also the the innovation in the countries, right? And um, like I said, it's proven that countries that have a very uh, well-developed infrastructure, and now we're talking about mobile network infrastructure, right? And a very consistent coverage and capacity and performance in the networks actually lays in the forefront in enterprise innovation, but also in MBB innovations, such as, uh, XR and VR, communication through um, all kinds of journalism, all kinds of smart ports and smart cities and the enterprise space. So the benefits will come from multiple of different verticals, if you want to say it that way. But I think to build the platform is, of course, the first greatest step. So Portugal will truly benefit from you being the best in Europe. So great step. And, and what about the society impact? You mentioned briefly, but can you mm-hmm. elaborate a bit more? Uh, what advantage do you see and uh, now and in the future um, in terms of the capacities that uh, uh, these kind of networks, these high performance networks can bring uh, in terms of experience and new services to both the business and also uh, the consumer market? So I think traditionally we've looked a lot on, on the downlink, right? And I think that's been kind of the the backbone of, of building out the networks because the smartphone users, we've been very data and content hungry for the downlink. What we now see that is the uplink is, is starting to become more and more important. And why we say that is that we need not just high capacity peak speed networks, but we need resilience and we need also to have a consistent network. So it doesn't matter so much if you have a completely great downlink if you can't really reach the network. So the uplink is becoming a more of an of a of an area to develop. That's what we see. And when you do develop the uplink, we can have, for example, very steady video links upstream. And I'm sure Portugal has this as, as many other countries in Europe. We have a lot of coastline and so does so do you, right? So building out coastlines with, for example, video surveillance for ships entering into harbors, fishing fleets, uh, everything that is mobile and things that are not 
only onshore, things that are a little offshore and onshore and always in, in, in the mobile world seem to be a really great first step to build um, an operator's network, you know, offering a slice into the enterprise world. Um, other things we see is red cap, this reduced capability, which means that we can have uh, lower cost of devices, which means that we can just kind of flood uh, the market or whatever use case we would we would go into with many devices. We don't have to sit and count, you know, like, oh, we have five devices here, they're so expensive. So that will be another source of, of great, I think, innovation, not having that constraint that we have, we have so few devices that we can use. And then a third thing that I think is becoming important for monetization is stadiums for enterprises and also for, for, for you, right, to bring uplink capacity into stadiums, even if it's so that it's the stadium orchestrator that is actually needing this uplink for TV services or for mobile journalists or whatever it can be, or if it's actually for the spectators in the stadiums. Um, so we, we see those things as being the next driver for more opportunity on revenue on your side, but of course for us, an opportunity to build more, right? To build resilient and more quality uplink heavy networks. Ericsson is, is performing um, several uh, studies, uh, several international studies. And um, what we have seen in the, in the last years is that there is a clear correlation uh, between the quality and the coverage of these mobile networks and the, and the impact and the growth of those countries. Can you tell us uh, how do you see in the real world how these um, good networks can contribute to this development of, of the countries it, itself? So I would like to make an analogy or an example. If we look behind us a bit, unfortunately, we have COVID, right? We had the pandemic hitting, at not, not, uh, hitting us not so long ago. And um, if we take an example of countries where you did have a, a good network build out already and you also had flexibility amongst the operators to quickly um, maybe assign new resources and, and add more spectrum to, to, to homes where people now needed coverage at home in order for their kids to keep up with their studies and for the, the parents of the, of the family to do their work remotely from home. I think the studies that we saw was that we had an extreme traffic pattern shift, right, in the first months of, of COVID when all the, all the offices shut down and all the schools shut down. So I, I must say that the countries that had that flexibility and had uh, already the, the networks built as a backbone, both with transmission and with mobile networks, they had a much faster pick up in efficiency in the remote working force and also in the schooling of the children. And it's hard to say, OK, does that really matter? It took one country one month and it took one country just two days, right, to get all this transition going. And it's, of course, hard to sit now and say, oh, it cost the country, you know, two billion euros. It's very difficult to count. But what I think we can see is that those countries have a less of an impact of loss of workforce, um, loss of, of schooling, in, I mean, children not really dropping out of school, for example. So if we just take that as an example, that was an extreme example, but we also now can use that as, a, as, that as an example to see how important the networks are for the society. And if you now continue your great path of building a very high performing network in Portugal, the Portuguese industry and the people that is now going to use that network, they will benefit greatly. Exactly if it's going to be, you know, the uplink consistent networks for all the, you know, mobile journalists that you will have, or if it will be for, you know, closing the digital divide, maybe you have some areas that are still underserved. And if you can get them connected with high speed connectivity in a school, for example, uh, it will be of great benefit for the society for many, many, many years to come. And talking about 5G, what about sustainability? Because mm. we know that uh, uh, we have this challenge. Uh, we as a country, we as a, 
uh, participants on this on this planet, we have uh, an obligation concerning sustainability. Um, mm. Can you talk us about, uh, a little bit about uh, what is the impact of 5G um, in terms of uh, contributing to the sustainability of uh, of our networks? Mm, of course. So we have a goal, right, as an industry to be uh, net neutral in our CO2 uh, additions. And how we count here is that the connectivity that we provide as an industry should, of course, reduce the need to travel and to, to do things you know, that actually generate much more, much more carbon. So in that sense, I think we are we are on a good path to, to be able to prove that. Um, what we do within Ericsson then is that we want also to be net neutral in, in carbon. So whatever we produce for you to use as an operator should then be paid back. We shouldn't add any extra load on the on the carbon into the society and for that we need to work on energy efficiency of our products of course we need to have less uh watts per byte that we that we you know that or you or we would, would send out into into the air and that's a constant work for us and uh, one of the last um uh, radio um uh, massive mimo radios that we launched in barcelona this year it actually is 25 percent more energy efficient. So we will continue this path in every radio that we deliver to have a very, very strict goal on that it needs to be very, very much more energy efficient than the previous models. So that will continue. And then we're constantly looking into how much less carbon can we to use when we produce our products and how much less embodied carbon can we have including into the products that we then deliver to you. And this third step then is of course to have a circular economy. So if there's so that we need to take back and uh, remodel or reshape or reuse components and so forth, uh, then we do that. Um, so that we make sure that we don't create waste into the planet. So that's um, it's a very strict and, and strong program that Ericsson runs. And I know that many operators also have sustainability targets that we expose both to the stock market and then to, to all our owners. Anna, thank you so much for being here. It was really a very interesting discussion and conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to get to talk to you. Thank you.